now we're continuing on the next speaker, uh, uh, Zenia Bazelik. Uh, she's going to speak uh, the title of the Ethical Standards in Journal Publishing. And also I'd like to read her uh, CV to familiarize her. Um, Zenia Bazelik, uh, BA, PhD, Senior Research Fellow at the Department of Medical Informatics, Rijka University School of Medicine in Croatia. Her academic background lies both in social science and biomedicine. She received her master's degree in psychology in 2002 and PhD in social medicine in 2012. She teaches medical informatics statistics and scientific methodology. Her investigation for the PhD thesis, the value of plagiarism detection procedure in biomedical journals, was focused on the detection of similar texts within web services, Crosscheck and Eat Plus in the Croatian Medical Journal during 2009-2010 and the development of standard cooperating procedure for detecting and dealing with plagiarism in biomedical journals. She became research integrity editor at the Croatian Medical Journal in 2012 and chief editor of European Science Editing, the official journal of the European Association of Science Editors in 2015. Uh, please, Professor Bazir. Thank you. I'm really very happy to uh, be here in Adirmet and to have a possibility to give this lecture. Uh, I come from Rijeka. Rijeka is uh, a city uh, that has 150,000 people, like Edirne. My university is 60, uh, my medical school is 65 years old. So, uh, publishing a scientific uh, journal, uh, especially among the small journals, is very similar and uh, uh, the quality of the journal depends on the reliability of the published information. And the uh, reliability of the published information is uh, the editor's responsibility. And there are several editorial organizations and state organizations that deal with ethical standards and editorial uh, work. So, uh, the most important ones, as Anna has said before, are CO, Committee Publication Ethics, is the European Association of Science Editors, uh, Council of Science Editors, World Association of Medical Editors, and ICMGA. And the state organizations are uh, U.S. Organization Office of the Research Integrity, which was the first as such founded in 1992, and the European Network of Research Integrity Offices. And this is the map of the Research Integrity Offices. In Croatia, we had, uh, have had our national body till 2009, but unfortunately, uh, with the new government, it was uh, closed, so we don't have a national body dealing with ethical questions. And hopefully, we will have it in the future, and the other and the Balkan countries will be included in this organization. <coughs> so the editor is responsible for ensuring uh, the ethical standards, but unfortunately, as we all know, the probability of detecting scientific misconduct is uh, low. And it is always discovered uh, after the publication. And the most common problems editors are dealing with is redundant public, uh, publication, plagiarism, duplicate submission, undisclosed co conflict of interest, authorship problems, and maybe the least common are fabricated and falsified data, but those are really big problems. Um, also, there is a document published in 2007, uh, written by Liz Wager and Associates, uh, about uh, what should be best practice guidance on publication ethics, how, how should we deal with those questions, and they are addressing transparency, authorship, uh, conflict of interest, research integrity, and the peer review process. I will talk about uh, the first four and I'm sure Anna will talk about peer review processes later. So the research, we are always speaking about scientific misconduct. 
uh, what is bad, but the concept of the research integrity, what, what is good or how should, should we um, behave is how always on the side. So this is only one of the definitions uh, given by Nicholas Stenek, an authority in the research integrity. What is research integrity indeed? So I will read the definition. This, uh, the research integrity is the quality of possessing and steadfastly adhering to high moral principles and professional standards as outlined by professional organizations, research institutions and when relevant the government and public. Uh, he also states that uh, there are major uh, consequences of such a response if we breach uh, uh, research integrity and those um, behaviors can undermine the reliability of the research record. It weakens the trust in science, in scientists. Uh, unfortunately, it also can raise research funds and in biomedicine which is most uh, dangerous, it can lead to harmful decisions and impact the human health. So, <coughs> when we talk about breaches of re um, ethics and research integrity, we always speak about uh, scientific misconduct. And the most severe forms of scientific misconduct are so-called the dark triad. Um, Fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, you will uh, also find it in the literature as FFP. But also there are uh, uh, least severe uh, practices that can also undermine, undermine the scientific uh, process. And they are called questionable research practices, QRP. And uh, those kind of behaviors, uh, they, are, they don't include honest errors. <laughs> so, fabrication, as you probably know, is making up data or results and recording on uh, reporting them. This is the definition given by Office of Research Integrity and written in Federal Policy on Research Misconduct by the White House. Fabrication is really hard to detect. It is, um, the cases of fabrication are always documented after the publication and then if it's uh, discovered the pub those publications are um, retracted. Now I'm uh, giving you a question, should we uh, do something about that? Should we um, always ask author for the raw data so we can if we suspect something, we can analyze those data, or should we ask the data later? We can discuss it at the panel. So, uh, <clears throat> mostly uh, it is, there is an opinion among editors that when data are posted, we can preserve the scientific data, the evidence, and we can give a, a chance to learn from the data of others. So what are the rates? How common is uh, fabrication and falsification? This is a study done by Fanelli in 2009. It was published in PLOS ONE. And uh, among uh, seven articles that were dealing with fabrication and falsification, he had found out that the admission rate of fabrication and falsification was 2%. So, Maybe it is really common because if we publish a uh, hundred articles, there is a probability that two of them were fabricated or falsified. Those are big fabrication scandals, I believe you have heard about them. The first one is from Jan Sudbo. It, it was famous because it was the first, the first very well documented and um, retracted from Lancet, Lancet and afterwards uh, retracted uh, from another uh, 11 journals or 11 articles. Uh, he was from Norwegia and a stomatologist and he was studying oral carcinoma. And now he works as a stomatologist at the northern part of Norwegia, um, I don't know, 
close to the Northern Pole <laughs> because he has lost his licenses and was bound to work for, I don't know, a few years. The second one is really um, for the Guinness Book of Records because they have uh, retracted, uh, I don't know, 172 papers, uh, Japanese anesthesiologist. Uh, he has never saw his patients and his co-authors uh, didn't see the data. It was really, really a big scandal. And the third one is one of the recent ones. Uh, a, thank you very much. Diedrich Steppel, a Dutch uh, psychologist who fabricated and falsified data in at least 55 papers. The problem is even bigger because there were PhDs done of, on this data that was fabricated and he was a leader of an institute promoting um, public, publicly uh, some kind of stereotypes. So there was um, a community also involved in his findings. He is now uh, also uh, uh, the papers are retracted and his PhD is also I think. The detection of fabrication is really hard and when we are um, addressing detection of fabrication uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk about image manipulation as Anna has shown there are droplets that can help you to detect image manipulations but uh, we are rarely talking about um, data manipulations and how can we detect uh, data manipulations. So uh, there, there are, um, uh, this is a, a test for an Amelius patterns that was written by um, American psychologists, uh, Peyton Hill and statisticians and they address um, how to detect uh, fabrication and the first uh, thing that editor should look when um, he looks at the paper, at the data, the statistical editor, he could uh, look at the mean uh, values and the standard differences. If uh, he has uh, different groups, uh, it is not uh, expected that the groups have uh, equal standard uh, deviations and equal uh, standard um, mean values. So there, there are also there is also a test a spreadsheet that uh, can detect anomalies in data, or if data has been I don't know doubled, triplicated, and then analyzed. And uh, Dr. Pitt can provide uh, to a statistician his uh, spreadsheet to help you uh, detect fabrication. So falsification is uh, as bad as fabrication. Uh, it means uh, manipulating research materials, equipment, processes, or changing or omitting data. So the results are not accurately represented in the research record. It also includes falsification of data and images. As we have talked uh, before, um, there are uh, tools, droplets, uh, that can help you uh, detect image manipulation in Adobe Photoshop. This is actually a picture from um, a real uh, study that was retracted. This was also a famous, uh, a famous uh, case by Deepak Das. He was an American investigator of um, excuse me, uh, because I'm a psychologist, not a doctor. He was investigating preservatol and his effects on the cardiovascular uh, health. And it was um, documented that he has um, fabricated the images and that the alcohol consumption is not as good for our health as it was thought. So this is uh, how he was uh, splicing and copying and pasting um, in the image and doing manipulating his images. So now we are coming on plagiarism, my favorite uh, topic. 
Plagiarism, uh, there are many definitions of plagiarism, but um, for the last uh, few, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, uh, this is the accepted definition. So it's the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results or words without giving appropriate credit to the source or the author. So I have given here um, some resources where, where you can read in detail about it and some uh, advices how uh, to uh, avoid plagiarism or how to address plagiarism in a journal. The first one is from Miguel Roy from St. John's University uh, in the USA. <clears throat> he actually comes from the social sciences, but this was uh, uh, published uh, in PubMed and is addressing mostly biomedical issues. The second one uh, is a paper, uh, discussion paper from Cope, written by Liz Bajer. Really, really very uh, helpful. And the third one is uh, the short, uh, short article about text recycling, about uh, self-plagiarism. And also there are Cope flowcharts, you have seen them, I suppose. Yes. Are you acquainted with the Cope flowcharts? Yes. Okay, Jen knows everything. What are the rates of plagiarism? This is a really, really a very recent meta-analysis of plagiarism done over by my colleague Pupa Vatsvanya and also Daniela Fanelli, mentioned before. And they have um, been analyzing a lot of articles that were addressing plagiarism and uh, there is really a different uh, rate among scientists. Scientists uh, admit that they have committed plagiarism in 1%, average is the 1.2%, and they admit that they have witnessed plagiarism, seen, seen it among the others, in about 30%. So there is a big discrepancy between I plagiarize and I know someone other, somebody else is plagiarizing. So maybe the truth is in the middle. What are the types of uh, plagiarism? The most uh, severe one is the so-called latent plagiarism, major or gross plagiarism. When you take a large amount of text from somebody else's work and you don't uh, give the credit. We uh, all at the Croatian Medical Journal think it's uh, 50 or more percent. And then we call it major plagiarism. There can be different views. This is the view of the Croatian Medical Journal editorial board. Then there is uh, also a form of uh, major plagiarism that is uh, very common, uh, becoming very common with the Google translation system. It's a translation without acknowledgement. It means you take, I don't know, an English paper, put it into the Google Translate, then uh, rearrange it a bit and make it your own article in your own language. That's really a problem. It can be, uh, it can be detected by a careful reviewer as you were talking in the morning, only if the references are all the same. If not, it's really difficult to um, uh, detect it. Then there is better plagiarism. I think this is the most common form. When you take a piece of one article, a piece of second article, third, fourth, and then you make a patch, a mosaic of sentences that you like and put it into your paper and present it as your own work. That's the most, I think that's the most common form of uh, uh, plagiarism for non-English speakers. And one of the um, reasons is the low level of proficiency in English and maybe also uh, the low level of proficiency in scientific methodology. 
somebody doesn't know how to write the methods and reads some other methods or some other parts of the discussion of somebody says, oh, this is what I mean, what I'm thinking, it's a good sentence, I will take it. Then there is pseudo paraphrasing. It means that uh, you take somebody others, uh, someone other's text, uh, you put the reference, but you don't put the, how do you say, the citation, the quotations. You omit the quotation marks and you uh, cite it. It is still a plagiarism, textual plagiarism. Then there is a, a minor plagiarism when there are similar uh, um, sentences that can be found everywhere in, in, in each article. For example, the, author share, the authors share no conflict of interest. These are six words and can be defined as uh, text similarity, but in fact they are not. Or the statistical difference was below 0 0.05. And then there is technical plagiarism. Um, it, it refers to appropriation of material and methods. We were talking uh, yesterday about it. So um, technical plagiarism is not considered as serious as other forms, other uh, as blatant and petrol plagiarism and pseudo paraphrasing. It is um, the author should. Um, if they take somebody else's methods, they should cite the original article. And of course, uh, when I make a decision about an article, if it's plagiarized or not, the position of the similar text is uh, very important. Uh, the similarity in discussion or in conclusions is not allowed. <coughs> this is considered plagiarism. Oh, I think we are going to have a discussion now here. <laughs> what is self-plagiarism? Does it exist? <coughs> so, this is a definition uh, of my Miguel Roig also. I have mentioned him before. So, it, the self-plagiarism is usage of uh, portions of an earlier work in a new one without citing the original content. There are editors, famous, ed, famous editors like Ian Chalmers and the editor, um, I don't remember the name of the Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia, um, I will remember later. They say that it's not possible to steal from yourself. How, how am I self-plagiarizing if I'm telling the same uh, thought once again? I'm not going to write uh, new sentences for the same thought every time. Then, on the other hand, there are copyright issues. If you use the same text, more than 10%, are you plagiarizing or not? <coughs> then there are boundaries of reuse. How much of the text can be reused if it's our text? How much is uh, Okay, and how much is self-plagiarism? How can we decide as an editor? 10%, 15%, 30%, 50%. We have to be careful and in, in every case we, we make uh, an, a decision. There is no rule for it because every case is unique. And how to define it? Miguel Rose says that it's really important if the presence of significant overlap for the creation medical journal, it would be for the self plagiarism 25%. The absence of a clear indication as to the relations between the various duplicates or related papers. So there can be similarities with your previous work, but you have to uh, make a clear connection 
uh, with the new uh, work and the old one and explained uh, the connection. If you have a follow-up, you have to explain that uh, the findings from before or that the methods have been used before. So, what are the types of self-plagiarism? The most severe type is the duplicate or multiple publication. So, the authors publish an article and then um, he sends it to another journal, maybe he changes the title, changes the order of authors, if he's really how to say, dedicated to scientific work, he changes a little bit in abstract, but the uh, paper is still the same. So, uh, this is the most uh, common paper of duplicate publication that can easily be detected by Authenticate. But there, is also, there are also various forms, and uh, when the data is still the same, it is uh, the same data, the analysis can be the same, but I don't know, we had a case in Croatian Medical Journal when um, the data was the same, but it was not presented in tables as before, but it was presented in figures. And the text was rearranged, so it is the same investigation, the same idea, the same conclusions, but written in a different language. Is it plagiarism, self-plagiarism or not? It is. It is a duplicate publication because there is no scientific novelty. What about if the editors agree uh, to publish both of the uh, journal editors agree to publish it in their journals? Can we call it again a uh, duplication? <coughs> No, 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 this is the, the, the other secondary publication, which yeah. is, okay, you it have, is legitimate. Yeah, it's uh, legitimate if you say, you know, this uh, paper was originally published out in JEPA, we are republishing now in the Baltimore Medical Journal. As long as there is transparency and indication that, you, that this is a legitimate duplication, then it's fine. Especially if there are uh, guidance, guidelines, yeah. they can be published For several example. times. Sorry, I have a question. For example, some statements uh, in uh, some journals, um, like uh, uh, some uh, international activities, is it uh, the declaration text may be uh, published in the different journals? Uh, is, there, is, is it any? Is it is it duplication or not? No, but, but it would be good to have a line at the end or at the beginning. This statement is published in all, I don't know, 13 uh, member journals of ICMJ. Because, for example, when ICMJ publishes the statement, they publish it in all 13 journals, maybe at different times, you know, because some of them are weekly, some are published. As guidelines for interactions were published, I don't know, many times. So you say <coughs> these uh, guidelines are published simultaneously in several journals. And then people who are indexing, we don't have time to go into detail here. We did a study on uh, indexing of duplicate publications in, in Medline. So indexers will take something that is duplicate if they don't see the reason for duplication. Now, if you publish a statement in many journals and you don't state that it's simultaneously published in uh, um, your journals, then it may end up being tagged as a duplicate publication by Medline. Because Medline takes instructions, but it also takes duplicate publication. When indexers in uh, Medline, when they look at the paper and see similarities, they automatically, without alerting the journal, uh, take articles as duplicate publications. And they don't differentiate between the original and the duplication. Both will get to take as duplicate publications. So it's always good, your transparency is key to everything. Everything is allowed. <laughs> As long as yes. you state it and people can see, so that we know that this is the same study and that somebody is doing a meta-analysis or systematic review, doesn't take it, these two studies as original ones and count to the same patient twice.
that's the, the problem with dealing with publication. Yes, and there is also a bigger problem with the augmented publications. It means that uh, an author collects the data, I don't know, for example, 50 patients, and analyzes the data, and then publishes a paper. After, I don't know, three months, he collects 55 patients and tries to publish, analyzes the data, uses the same uh, text, portions of text, and tries to publish in another, day, another journal. It's called augmented publication. There is really no novelty. Uh, the data is almost the same, and there is no rationale for uh, the reader or the editor to publish such publication. Is it uh, the same with like 50 patients with 150 patients? I published the, the paper with 50 patients. Uh, a year after that, I published it with No, it's, uh, it's so not the published. same because I suppose when you published the 150, you have stated that uh, there was a pilot study or this was the follow-up of your study and you were um, citing your previous paper. Mm -hmm. But in the case of augmented publication, the authors omit the site. They try to... Uh, how to say it? Uh, they don't admit that they have published it before. Or there is uh, also a case I don't know, they have collected a lot of parameters on 50 data and then uh, they have published one analysis and then after, I don't know, six months they try to publish the, the, the other statistical analysis of the same data which in fact could be all published in one. This is a, a less severe... Um, but still, you know, it's important for you know, the synthesis of data if uh, people don't know that it's the same yes. patients. That you have to be transparent because uh, there are also, also rationals when it is okay. When there are large, uh, I don't know, multi-center studies that uh, a paper couldn't have, I don't know, 50 pages. Maybe it could be have separate pages. I know Melissa Anderson did uh, with her uh, investigation such uh, he chunked it, uh, she chunked, chunked it, but always there has to be an explanation. Should you okay. the author decide the first paper? Yes, yes always. The, yeah, that's the important thing. You say, you know, uh, the, you know, we did analysis on 50 patients and now, you know, now we have 150 patients, especially if the, your results change, if your conclusion yeah. is different on 150, then or, the, or you have patients, a, then it's, you know, editors would like to publish that because it will give new information. Especially it's always interesting in prospective studies to follow up the results or if you have uh, long prospective studies that last for, I don't know, 10 years, you are not going to wait for 10 years to publish your results. You will, I don't know, publish it after 2, 5 and then 10 years. And you will have three publications, but you have to be transparent always. Always cite and then you are safe. And then the editor will decide, is it, uh, does it bring enough novelty, is it interesting or not, but you are clear. You said that big, um, huge variables in one multi-centric um, study. Uh, I presented one or two data on one paper, and I'm going to present two or three data in another paper. Should I have to mention the previous one? Yes. Okay. This is not the uh, Especially in the methods, because the methods have been written before, so you can say that in the introduction you can say that it's a part of the large multi-centric study and then you will cite it and uh, you can also cite in the methods. Uh, in case of Gordon Meister or Southern, uh, I publish a paper with 150 patients and then I make a reanalysis with 50 patients. So long it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> but the data differs. But you know, if, if you say, okay, we published 150. Another publication. Yeah, if you make, we published uh, 150 patients, and now we're analyzing a subgroup, and this is a presentation of a subgroup analysis, then it's fine, and it's up to the editor to decide. It's also uh, transparency.
always like to and it's, it's good because the interns would like you just like the reviewers. You always it's better to uh, list the limitations of your study yourself than to have reviewers identify what is wrong and say, hey, they didn't mention this. It's better that you have it in the open and then I think editors respect it more and they not trust, but they, they kind of value the transparency more than just the, the data that you're presenting. I think it's very useful and important. I think editors like when you say it kind of gives credibility to your research. And then later they will decide whether it's, as you said, novel enough or not. Okay. Well, uh, sometimes might not be considered the return of publication if it actually uh, presents some statistics that in the original article did not reach statistical significance. And uh, actually this second uh, manuscript acts as complementary. Uh, but uh, then it stated, is it in, uh, an original article or a letter to the editor adding to the original article? Uh, then we uh, issue a correction. Yes, and another, and another issue is sometimes uh, uh, authors do revisit uh, the uh, original raw data and identify secondary outcomes uh, that they have not been designed in the first uh, study. Uh, the problem then is sometimes they cannot, uh, as this is outcomes not predicted in the design of the study, they don't have uh, elimination of the co-founders and the, the, the integrity of their data might not be valid. So uh, you have to be balanced between redundant publication and uh, a, a not well designed a publication because sometimes when they, they make secondary outcomes that have not have been designed in the first place, uh, they use the same cohort, it's totally different study, but because it's more retrospective if you understand of this data, uh, more, more of the uh, occasions are not valid and are not valid to be printed. I think this is uh, more a questionable research, research practice than scientific conduct itself yes. and uh, we as an editors have to look upon these things uh, when reviewing the article especially the statistical editor he has to be very careful about the statistical methods that, that were used if uh, the proper methods are used so I will speak now about the detection of plagiarism in scientific journals for I don't know, for about uh, a long time, uh, it was always uh, discovered after the publishing and um, <coughs> means of correcting the literature were retractions and retraction is always something very um, difficult to make, as you probably know, and a very strong step for a journal editor, but now with the um, uh, development of ICT, we have uh, plagiarism detection software that can help us directly um, found uh, the text similarity. And we must not forget the, that the prevention of plagiarism and the scientific misconduct itself should always include also the education. <coughs> so we could, uh, we have to read a lot and be current in the findings, uh, know about guidelines, flowcharts, uh, publications about scientific misconduct and research integrity, uh, attend workshops, forums and communicate among ourselves as an editors. This is a COPE flowchart about uh, um, addressing plagiarism. I believe you have seen it all, or if not, you can find it on the COPE uh, page, flowcharts. Uh, there are uh, different plagiarism detection software that can be found in the market, but uh, mostly if we address scientific uh, literature and the detection of plagiarism in scientific publishing, we are talking about uh, the cross-check web service, uh, also called Authenticate. And for the academic integrity, yes, I, how many of you are university teachers? Everyone. Everyone is university teachers. So now at uh, Rijeka University, uh, we have a uh, Turnitin. How do, we, how do I use this for the light? 
Okay, the middle one. Okay, we have turn it in for the whole university, and uh, we will check all the final works of students and postdoc students. And I have just finished writing those instructions for Turnitin and maybe in a few years I will tell you how, how it went. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to investigate it. I work at the Department of Medical Informatics. And my boss uh, is an expert in academic integrity. So uh, there are various <coughs> programs. There are also <laughs> offline programs. If uh, you, your journal doesn't have a cross check or authenticate. If it's too expensive for you, you can use. And if you maybe suspect um, that somebody had plagiarized uh, the work and you have those texts, you can compare them with an no offline free uh, software. I didn't write it, I'm sorry, I, I, I forgot because I have cross check. It's called W Copy Find. It's free of charge, so if you have uh, some uh, two or more texts and you suspect it's similar, W Copy Find is free of charge, very uh, small program and easy, user friendly to use, and it can compare text and give you the text similarity rate. W Copy Find. The author of this program is Louis Bloomfield. B L W O M F I E L D. <coughs> so, for the purposes of detecting plagiarism in scientific uh, publishing, we use CrossCheck. So, CrossCheck is a plagiarism detection software uh, that requires a membership in Crossref, and with the identical algorithm, you have a text uh, that is submitted to cross-check and this is it works a lot and really seriously as in the real factory and it checks the this text with the internet and with a large cross-check database I think now it has about 50 million papers and then it generates a text similarity report that gives a text similarity index. I believe you have seen it before. So Crossref is an association of publishers and journals. It has more than 4,000 members now. And uh, when you um, are a member of Crossref, then your articles are <coughs> uh, begin to have DOI, digital object identifier, and you can put uh, your uh, articles in the cross-check database. So uh, this is the link for the membership. You have to write their membership publication and data form and PILA membership agreement. The annual fee for the cross-check is $275 and after the annual fee you also have to uh, pay for the indexing of articles. So, in order to have cross-check and authenticate, you have to be a cross-check member and to pay an annual fee of $55. And then you pay uh, um, a uh, $0.75 for checking uh, one article. This is an example um, if you have 125 uh, submitted articles. This is what the Balkan Medical Journal is, I think, paying for a month, about $100 for a project. So this is cross-check, text similarity reports, this, these are the names of the articles and the text similarity rates. We uh, look all the articles, regardless of the text similarity rate, because this is the report I like to look, so I look this similarity index, but I don't um, consider it a good measure of similarity because I think it can be mis misleading in many, uh, many times it can be misleading. 
So this is the original text, the text that was submitted to a journal. And on the right part you have the sources found on the internet and in the electronic databases. And uh, this article is 29% uh, um, similar. Uh, the submitted article is 29% similar with the found article and the 7 and so on. So when you click on the on the one source you can see the text that was submitted and the text that was published. And in this case it is all very clear. There is a text similarity. So. Uh, this is cross-check and uh, for my PhD th thesis I have done an investigation of plagiarism in, in the Croatian Medical Journal. Uh, the aim of this two-year study was um, to determine prevalence of plagiarism and to develop a standard procedure uh, for detecting plagiarism. All manuscripts uh, were checking, uh, checked uh, during the two years. We have used ET Plus which is a free uh, program that can uh, check text similarity of abstracts in PubMed. Uh, we have used uh, CrossCheck, Authenticate, and uh, W Copy Find that I have mentioned before. And what is uh, most important, uh, the texts that were textually similar or suspected to be plagiarized, I have manually verified them. Read uh, the original submitted article and the found articles and look for similarities by reading the boat. Do you do that in uh, your journal? Yes. Yeah. Do you have an editor responsible for the uh, research no. and text? Each, Each uh, section editor takes it. That's also a good solution. So this was the procedure of my study. So we had 754 articles. We have checked the abstracts with TT+. Plus and with cross-check and afterwards with W copy find. So cross-check uh, was more successful than uh, ET Blast. It is normal, it is free, the, only the abstracts were checked, so it is always better to check the whole text. And then I have uh, done the section analysis. I have looked for similarities in each section, checked the authors in the Deja Vu data database. Have you heard about Deja Vu yes. database? Yeah. Yes, and uh, manually verify the text. And out of all 85 uh, papers, uh, manuscripts were found to be plagiarized. It's 11%. So 85 uh, papers were plagiarized. They were mostly true plagiarism, which is uh, contradictory to the previous results in the literature. But I think most of the literature is Western and the habits uh, and our cultures are really different. So these are the real results for our population. According to the extent of plagiarism, mostly uh, the, articles, uh, the articles were majorly plagiarized, very rare. This is uh, true plagiarism. Uh, more, more than 50% was found in 9 articles, 1% and this is <coughs> and this is about 20 so most of them, were, if they were true plagiarism they, were, uh, they had a low text similarity rate this is the distribution of plagiarized articles so most of the articles of plagiarized um, most of the authors of plagiarized uh, articles were from China, Croatia and Turkey. Or how to say it, Croatia, China and Turkey. And these are the others all together. And this is normal because uh, most of the submitted articles are also <coughs> from Croatia, Turkey and China. But I think there is uh, there is uh, this, this discrepancy. The authors from China plagiarize uh, more than the authors from Croatia and Turkey. So, what's the percentage is Chinese? What are the percentages? One in four is plagiarist. 
What is the percentage of well, authorized uh, compared to non About three and a half percent from China, Croatia, and Turkey altogether. Okay. Eleven. If, if, if you break it down, okay, plagiarism uh, in the Chinese articles itself. Uh, I mean, what is the percentage of the total Chinese articles that you received that were plagiarism? Ah, eleven percent. I've said it before. Eleven percent. 11% of submitted articles yeah. had similar texts and were plagiarized, but they were not all majorly plagiarized. So what was this percentage if you only the Chinese articles? Because it seems, it seems there like if it is 25 to 30%. I don't know, uh, I have to look it, but it's about 2.5% think from yeah, this but picture. But you look only at Chinese papers, I think it's about one quarter of... The, it, there is a significant a statistically significant difference because I have calculated it for my PhD. I didn't put the numbers on, I'm sorry. And from the Turkey there is also a statistical well, difference, but on the well, other side. Coming from China, one four is yes. But this is not, um, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm against uh, such conclusions because yeah, uh, if we have a conclusion one in a four uh, from China is a plagiarist, I'm always looking, I'm going to look to the Chinese or oh, their plagiarists. Yes, so I don't uh, like to think in such I also terms. think like you, the, for example, in one paper published in Nature in 2007, I think, about uh, the title was like that, Turkish Physics uh, Plagiarized. And there was a big um, uh, title in the middle of the paper, and it was written in this center. And everybody can exactly see that there are some cultures where uh, stealing cannot be uh, bad, something like that. No. So when I see this, I was upset. I didn't you were like horrified. It. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have to panic. It means that Turkish people accept stealing something like that. This, uh, you are not an honest nation. Yeah. It's really uh, hard to think in, in such words. Oh, Chinese, they plagiarize. Yeah, you, we should be aware of Chinese. Just asking for the percentage, just the problem. Yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to so. uh, Sorry. Uh, those three countries are not native English speakers. And uh, what are those others? Are they uh, native English speakers? Because I think... There uh, were uh, uh, native English uh, speakers uh, that... That have plagiarized, but most of uh, the, the authors who submit to Croatian medical journals are not native speakers of English. Yes, because of this, uh, it seems like it's uh, plagiarism maybe, but uh, the countries uh, which are not the native English speakers uh, can have this problem uh, more than the other countries who are speaking in English. Yeah, I think the main region, uh, reason for. Uh, Plagiarizing and petrol plagiarism, as I've said before, is low English proficiency. May I comment? Yes, of course. Uh, Western countries where English is uh, easy to learn and uh, is a daily usage, they are good at uh, not in plagiarism, but they are good at in publication and publication. This is not my idea, this was said by a, a professor from the United States, I think Dr. White, uh, the uh, co-editor of the emergency and anesthesia <coughs> technology. Uh, may I ask, uh, here you have only two categories, plagiarist and non plagiarist <coughs> I mean, what is the cut-off point of uh, similarity in this? I will show you. Uh, it was 10% for the study, <laughs> and uh, after so the if study, you more than 10 in one source. No, this is called a suspicion of plagiarism. Right. So they were verified by you. Yes. Okay. Do, you, do you exclude the references? Yes. 
when I was uh, doing the, the, this analysis, uh, it was done with this offline program WCopyFine, and I have excluded uh, from the body text uh, the references, the title, the author's affiliation, the titles of figures and tables. So, according to the section of manuscripts, uh, the mostly self-plagiarized uh, section was materials and methods, which is expected, and then the discussion and introduction, and afterwards uh, the, the less the results, which is also an expected result. And uh, the true plagiarism was mostly similar in all the sections, but also uh, mostly found in, true, in uh, material and methods and results. I'm sorry. Uh, is it, uh, can you make a plagiarism on table names? Like, you can, can you use uh, from another text um, taking a table name like the relationship between this and that and this population? And can you use it in your uh, own manuscript? If you use it, is it plagiarism? Maybe if you use it and use only this title, it wouldn't be recognized by the cross-check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's it not good to use other good, people's... We can, uh, can we, call it we can call it text similarity, I would say. So, after the study, we have developed the standard pr procedure for submitted articles. So every article submitted in the Creation Medical Journal is checked with cross-check. And if it has more than 10% text, uh, 10 text similarity rate in one source, or if it has more than 15% similarity in multiple sources and the uh, threshold for each is minimum 5%, it is considered suspected of uh, plagiarism and then I check it with check the check it with W copy find that offline program and afterwards uh, I check each section and I decide uh, after the manual uh, verification the reading of both articles if it's plagiarism or not and each uh, author is afterwards sent, uh, sent a text similarity report you will see it later. This is my first case when uh, on the left side you see uh, original article, on the, uh, the right side the text was similar 58%. I think it's a really an easy case. So the full text was similar 55%, an abstract 40 to, to, to you see. And it's not really uh, a strong uh, you don't have to be, I don't know, very uh, intuitive to conclude that it, this was a case of true plagiarism. And maybe sometimes without reading you can guess, but you always have, always have to read both articles. This is my second case, when there was a textual similarity about 20 percent in one um, in one paper, published paper. So the full text was 80 percent and material and methods were 55 percent. This was from another author. And um, what would be the steps? I think I would, uh, this was the case, I, I wrote to, to the author, tell them that this was considered technical plagiarism and uh, if the peer review is going to continue, they would have to cite the original article. And change the words. No, you cannot always change all the words if there is a standard procedure, as we were always taking it and, I don't know, inventing the new method or something. But you have to cite the original article. So they, didn't they didn't cite it. Yeah. 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 It, it could be. Consider. So when they cite, this similarity yeah. can be accepted. Can be accepted. Yeah. You can, you know, we discussed it last night, you can say, you know, this procedure was performed according to the, to 
then describe by a new yes. site, and there is nothing more that you have to write in your methods anyway. If you cite there or But uh, here, I, I said to you yesterday night that there are some <laughs> colleagues at our editorial club. They say that in their uh, uh, discipline, the material method should be described uh, in detail. You said this. Uh, in, in pathology, uh, in pathology. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, there should be very uh, descriptive materials and methods and uh, you cannot uh, always use different words for this materials and methods and uh, uh, if it is the same method with the other one, you should use the same and uh, I'm always thinking that if you are citing this article, it, it should be enough for it, it shouldn't be called plagiarism. No, it's uh, not. This, this is my opinion. Yes. What about Professor Marci said? Uh, just uh, <coughs> indicate the uh, previous reference and say it was uh, explained in this reference. No, okay. uh, you have know, 50 more minutes. I yes. the, uh, I understand wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you say that uh, there's no need to describe the methods? Just uh, citing it uh, is enough. I don't know, you, you are not going to describe a western blot. Yes. It was well documented in 1980. No. Okay. Or I don't know, uh, DNA replication okay. process. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about so... Yeah, but if it's a sub-specific method, it has to be described. For example, only one percent of, okay, of pathologists they can know this methodology, so I think they should uh, describe it uh, very often uh, in the method section. But then, should it be described word by word, hundred percent, or there are alterations? Uh, can be alterations, of course, uh, mm. but if there is no alteration, uh, or if there is little alteration, will it be Will it mean that it is plagiarism? But, yes, but, but if there is 100% similarity, I would consider it no, plagiarism. <laughs> but 50%, it means uh, you have taken from somebody but, else and uh, added your content. But your he is method. asking that you put the original reference. That's okay. This is still... No, no, no. But you write by verbatim text together with the original reference. No I never had such a case. I would have to think about it but really. We do, uh, this is the usual thing that we see, you know. Yes. They take the same text and put the original reference. And we still ask the authors to change the words. Yes. Of this was uh, This was really a rare case where full text was only 4% and the similarity was only in the references so uh, if you are using Authenticate please do not exclude references at the screen please do not exclude references because the similarities can be in the references and this is really um, uh, a true plagiarism 100% so the author was really um, trying to publish and I think a language professional helped to rewrite the whole article sentence by sentence. Every uh, sentence of this article was rewritten in, in good English and the idea was the same. I don't know, we have investigated uh, I don't remember what was it about. We can investigate it in Croatia. And then there was, there was an investigation in Croatia. That's how it was intelligently done. So look for the references. If there was only, his mistake was that the references were not mixed. If the references were mixed a little bit, or if there were some other references added, I don't know, maybe it would be sent to peer review or even published. But it's the same idea, the same article, it's plagiarized. 
And this is the text similarity report that we sent to all the articles of suspected uh, uh, manuscripts. So we indicate uh, the author, the code number of the manuscript, the title, the analysis, section analysis report, if there is a similarity in each section, how much is this similarity, and the editor adds his com her comments on doing it. So we can add, especially in the results section, if uh, the data is the same or if the de previously published data was used. This is really important. I can even tolerate text similarity, but we should never tolerate if somebody is taking others' data. Uh, if uh, the, it was cited, and we make a conclusion, and uh, if it's okay, we write what are the corrections that are needed, and if it's not, uh, we don't recommend it for publishing. And sometimes, if it's a major plagiar plagiarism, uh, we also send uh, a letter to the institution. But uh, with all my cases, I never got a response. So I, I cannot tell you about that experiences. So the question of, I, I have a lot to talk, I will speed up and some, some of the things we have also talked. Questionable research practices are considered less uh, serious but they also can undermine the scientific process and they are also to be uh, looked about. Stenek says that there are different types misrepresentation, those are authorship disputes, I am sure you have dealt with it. There are also inaccuracy when the, uh, the authors make citational errors, when they make improper conclusions, maybe uh, reading only the abstracts, not the whole paper, or if they are poorly reporting in their methods, choose a wrong statistical test. There are also a different kinds of biases. We have uh, talk, heard about conflict of interest, but there, are, there can also be an editorial bias. When an editor, I don't know, from uh, American journals uh, um, oftenly picks uh, American authors or authors from established uh, institutions and picks them for peer review more often than authors from non-established in, uh, institutions or from developed countries. There can also be statistical bias. This is a finalist meta-analysis on questionable research practices. They are, of course, more often than uh, uh, fabrication, falsification and uh, plagiarism. As you can see, we had about 1 or 2 percent of committed uh, fabrication and falsification and the committed QRP is 10 percent, so ten time, uh, five times more and someone, there was also a recent psychology uh, art, uh, investigation in psychology and about 90 percent of uh, psychologists have admitted that they have committed a QRP in their career. So this is uh, what is really often happening and we also have to be aware of it. About authorship, uh, I, Anna, are you going to talk about authorship? And, okay. So these are ICMJ uh, criteria. So I believe you, you know about it. So every author, in order to be an author, has to make substantial contribution to the concept of the design of the work or uh, the analysis or interpretation of data. He ha has to draft the work and revise it critically and the final version has to be approved. Uh, the least one is the new criteria so that the authors have to be accountable for all aspects of research. The pathology of authorship is uh, well documented and most of the pathologies are guest authorship, gifted authorship of ghost authorship. Ghost, it means that the author is not documented on the list. Gifted means that somebody is really not an author, but it, it is, I don't know, your colleague, your friend, your brother, and you give him the authorship. And the guest authorship, authors, authors uh, have 
some criteria. I don't know. He has uh, he had the idea, but he didn't uh, work uh, the paper work at the paper. And Anna told me yesterday that we shouldn't, as editors, uh, be so severe that people um, have to have chance to. Um, meet all the four criteria. Is yeah, this no, correct? Please not, explain. Uh, no, no, no. It's, uh, usually, especially in uh, clinical trials, you have people who are uh, taking <coughs> that attribute to patients and they never write or, or contribute to the manuscript, which, uh, you know, is wrong. So the new uh, definition of uh, ICMJ includes the four criteria, but it also later states that it is fair to offer all the people who have contributed to the first criteria, which is the collection of data, and then offer them the opportunity to contribute to mm -hmm. writing, it doesn't have to, run, to be writing the manuscript, but critical revision, which is also a contribution for uh, the authorship, uh, you have to offer them so that they can have the chance to be authors, that would be a fair. What you said is very important, thank you for this contribution. And also, this should be included to these four criteria. It is written out you know, in, in the definition of ICMJ, it yes. states that it should be offered. So it's now it official is, statement. It is already ICMJ. there? Yes, yeah, yeah, I haven't seen it before. Let me just and okay. I asked you in uh, last year in Brussels at COP meeting. Yes, yeah, uh, it wasn't still on. I mean, the, <laughs> it's new. I think it uh, came in uh, summer last year. Yeah. Yeah, after that, it came. Then. <laughs> Pizza is getting cold. Some do you remember? You asked this question, and I expect <laughs> Professor Marius that we find it very useful. There are also some discussion um, that the authors can be only people who have access to raw data. Yes. Okay. Can I just say that you know, in a paragraph after the definition. They say now, therefore, all individuals who met, meet the first criteria, which is the actual work, should have the opportunity to participate in the review, drafting, and final approval of the manuscript. Yeah, thanks. So now yeah, it's like a formal offer. Yes, so to be offered, and they really contribute and they satisfy all criteria. What is really important if you have an authorship uh, dispute in the journal is that <laughs> if there are any changes to be done uh, on authorship of the paper, all authors have to agree and to sign the statement that they agree with the changes, especially if somebody is going to be removed. So about conflict of interest we have talked. So the there is always uh, in an article, if an article, if an investigation was funded, uh, you uh, have to say transparently who funded the work. Sources of funding are very important. This is the conflict of interest form Anna has shown us. It is also very important to talk, uh, to state the uh, protecting the rights of research participants as subjects according to the last version of Helsinki World Medical Declaration of Helsinki and uh, the editor should make clear the standards they require oh, you have uh, your own national standards and they will be appropriate and you should seek uh, for the uh, ethics committee approval of the investigation and it is always stated in the methods, as you know, and encourage your peer reviewers in instruction to peer reviewers to look, uh, to consider those ethical issues. If there are animal research, then uh, you should always take care about the um, animals. If, um, if it's possible, you can use ripe guidelines on animal research reporting. So, uh, what can editors do in case they suspect misconduct? It is always um, really, uh, most of the problems can be uh, resolved if you contact the authors and uh, in a polite way ask them for the explanation. 
Sometimes it, it, it would be necessary to inform the author's institution and to ask them for, for help or to request additional help. During the investigation you should maybe issue an expression of concern. I think Anna is uh, better with those things because she has a lot of experience. So maybe um, afterwards uh, the correction or retraction can be um, issued. And uh, in any case you can always ask your editorial organization for advice, uh, so you can ask if you are a member of EASE or COPE, uh, how can I address this problem, please give me an advice and you will be advised. So editors are uh, mostly responsible for keeping the publishing record and not for investigating the misconduct. So uh, it is on you uh, to explain uh, to, I don't know, investigate the tax similarity and plagiarism, but if you suspect fabrication, we are not going to investigate it. It is going to be investigated in the institution of the author. And during the investigation, you will issue the expression of concern. Okay, I will speed up. This is the COPE guidelines on retraction. You can find it at COPE. This is the, also an interesting uh, material portal retraction watch that issues current uh, retractions and uh, you can find uh, a lot of news about retractions and scientific misconduct on this address. And at least this is crossmarked for correcting literature. Anna was talking about it earlier. This may be for big journals, but it is also connected with Crossref. So at the end, I just want to say that the maintaining the ethical standards in the journal it is a responsibility of an editor. It is always uh, important to educate yourself your peer reviewers and the authors uh, through the journal's instructions, through the workshops as we are meeting today, through the articles about ethical standards, research integrity and so on, and uh, informing yourself from the relevant organization and um, national bodies. Also, as we are all institu uh, uh, university teachers, it is not, uh, it is of utmost importance to educate young uh, authors or to educate students that will become authors and afterwards be, will become peer reviewers and editors. This is all for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ksenia, for your informative talk. Uh, we have to catch the schedule, uh, so okay. we are giving a, a lunch break. We're going to have a pizza here and then meet here at 1 p.m. Thank you. Maybe we can uh, be here where we eat in the corridor. We are all there. Yeah, you can eat here too. I mean that if we eat here, we can no, no, continue we, your discussion. We have 40 more minutes, so we can eat, uh, meet here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.